Every day I'm hustling, every day I'm hustling. All right, YouTube, just wanted to make a quick video here. I was trying to think, what could I do to add value to the car audio community? And uh, this is something that whether you've been in the car audio business for over decades or if you're brand new, just getting started, uh, the fundamentals really don't change. And there's some common things that a lot of people do uh, to make mistakes that cost them a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of anguish, a lot of rebuilds, and a lot of confusion wondering, why isn't it working how it's supposed to? Why doesn't it sound right? So I decided to make this video the top 10 biggest mistakes in car audio. Enjoy, here we go. All right guys, so here we go. Number one, insufficient electrical. Far too often I see people out there buying these big amplifiers, getting these subwoofers, wiring them down to a half ohm, quarter ohm, and they're running stock electrical. That is such a big mistake because not only are you gonna damage your car's electrical system, but you're gonna damage your car audio equipment as well, because running on low voltage is not a good thing if you understand electronics. So with that, upgrade your front battery, okay? At a minimum, when you start getting into building your system. Next, do the big three upgrade. If you don't know what any of these things are, Google, it's common knowledge, okay? Big three upgrade, get that OEM wiring swapped out and uh, get it beefed up a little bit. Uh, when you start getting a little more serious, right, and you start needing more amperage to your stereo, you gotta have to replace your OEM alternator. Most stock alternators do not put out enough amperage to support a big stereo, okay? Um, so when you start getting really big, you're gonna have to get two or three or four or 10 alternators, okay? But uh, at a minimum, you know, when you start getting serious, okay? Once you start getting a couple amps, maybe, you know, in the 2,500, 5,000 watt range, you really gotta start thinking about, well, is my stock alternator gonna supply the amperage needed to run this thing without dropping my voltage off, okay? So stock alternator, don't skimp on that, okay? You need to replace that thing. Uh, wiring, make sure you have the proper gauge wiring and enough of it, okay? If you're running a 10,000 watt amp in the back, you're gonna need more than one run of zero gauge going to the back. You're gonna need a few runs of it and then some good solid chassis grounds. Uh, something else, supplemental batteries, okay? Your secondary batteries. Talking about some AGMs in the back or lithiums. Uh, lithiums are kind of taking over the scene right now. All kinds of brands out there, excess power, uh, limitless, you name it but having those reserve batteries in the back uh, to supplement your car audio build is absolutely vital. Uh, something else a lot of rookies make with their electrical is, you know, they think that uh, capacitors are going to be a solve all for their voltage drops. That's just not the case, right? Those one farad, two farad, heck, five farad capacitors aren't gonna do much when you're working with a 10,000 plus watt stereo system. It's just, it's a joke in all honesty. So do it once, do it right. Upgrade your electrical and don't do it as an afterthought. Do it as you progress with your build, okay? So that way you're not giving yourself headaches, right? It's like eating your veggies before eating your dessert, okay? We don't wanna do it, but we know it's beneficial to do. So hope that helps. All right, number two, bad grounds. Yes, that can tie into electrical. However, this is something that a lot of people make mistakes with is their grounding. They don't ground their grounds properly, okay? The only way to do it right is by grounding it to the chassis, okay? To the frame of your car. I see far too often people making grounds to bolts on their seats, uh, to their seat belt bolts, where their seat belts bolt into their car. Uh, Pre-existing locations on the actual body, not even the frame, but the body of the car, uh, where they have like an antenna grounded from the factory, they just tap into that bolt there and think that a 10,000 watt stereo is gonna be able to have a proper ground at that point. Uh, it just doesn't work that way, okay? Do it once, do it right. If you're gonna ground your stereo, make sure that you do it to the frame, okay? And when you do it, grind it down to the metal. Another mistake I see is people, they just, you know, drill a hole, put a bolt on there and just leave it at that. Grind it down to the bare metal. Okay, so you have that copper terminal touching the direct shiny metal, okay, shiny metal of the frame. And then once you bolt it down, okay, I like to put some corrosive preventative there. Just spray it on there so that way it'll help battle, uh, you know, any kind of corrosive uh, properties that come with the elements. So 
again, I know it's simple, but it's something that a lot of new people just think that they can skimp on and that their car is gonna get the proper uh, electrical charge by simply grounding it in a subpar location. Just doesn't work, okay? Don't take shortcuts, ground to the frame. All right, number three, overpowering and underpowering your subs, okay? Both are not a good thing to do, uh, but if you had to do one, I would say one is better than the other and I'll explain in a little bit. But in order to not overpower or underpower your subwoofers, you need to understand two things, the difference between RMS power and peak power. I know if you're a veteran here, you're like, oh my gosh, why is he talking about this? But there's a lot of new people you gotta understand that don't know what those numbers are, okay? Peak power is the maximum amount of wattage that your subwoofer can take for a very short period of time, okay? RMS power is the continuous power that your subwoofer can take over the course of time safely. So you need to determine what that is, okay? And then secondly, you need to determine what the impedance is of your subwoofers, okay? How many ohms are they and how many voice coils are they? Because that's gonna determine how much power your sub is getting when you hook it up to your amplifier, okay? Because amplifiers are rated based off the ohms, okay? So let's say you have a 1000 watt amplifier, okay? And it's rated at 1000 watts at one ohm. That means if you hook a subwoofer up to it that has a one ohm final load, that means that if the amplifier is rated properly, right, but according to standards, that it's going to get a thousand watts, okay? Um, if you wire your subwoofer to a higher ohm load, let's say it's a dual four ohm voice coil, okay, and you wire it in parallel down to two ohms, you hook that same subwoofer up to that amplifier, you're not gonna get a thousand watts, okay? you're probably gonna get maybe five or 600 watts, half of that. And you know, it just keeps going like that, right? On the flip side, let's say you have a dual one ohm subwoofer and you wire that in parallel down to 0.5 ohm. You hook that 0.5 ohm subwoofer up to your amplifier, your thousand watt amplifier, and your subwoofer is gonna get more than a thousand watts, okay? It's probably gonna get 1200, 1500 watts if your amp is rated to do that, because a lot of mistakes people make too is they wire their amplifier down too low, below its rated power and ability to perform, and their amp goes into protect, it goes into thermal, it overheats, and uh, they don't know what's going on, right? Because they didn't configure their subwoofers properly. So these are all things that you need to know. And it's, it's kind of too much to put into one single video here, but these are things that you need to think about. And if anybody has any specific questions on that, just comment below here and I'll be happy to help, okay? But you gotta make sure that you understand, okay, how do I need to wire my sub to fit it to the proper amplifier so that I can give it RMS power, okay? Now, needless to say, like the subs that I have in here, my ZV5s, okay, they're rated at 2000 watts RMS, but everybody knows, okay, especially sundown junkies like myself, that you can throw four or 5,000 watts all day long and they'll happily take it as long as you properly set your gains, you're not sending a clip signal, and you're responsible with you know being diligent about that. And I do have videos of how to set your gain by ear properly. I'll go ahead and put a link here to that so you can watch it after, okay? But um, it's something that is absolutely necessary when you're talking about big power. So understand how to properly wire your subs, okay? And like I said, if you have to do it one way or another, I would rather you give too much power to your subs and then adjust your gains accordingly. That way you have headroom, okay? And you're not starving your subs. One of the worst things you can do is underpower your subs. Let's say um, you have a 2000 watt subwoofer, but you're only sending it 500 watts, okay? It's not bad per se, but what's gonna happen is what most people do is they compensate, They're like, man, it's not loud enough. So they turn their gain up higher, thinking it's a volume knob, okay? And to try to compensate for the less power they have in their amp, and that's where you get in trouble. That's where you send a clip distorted signal to your sub, bye-bye voice coils. So I hope that one helped. Moving on to number four. All right, so number four here, we touched on it a little bit in number three, but it's so important, it needs to be its own step here. Improperly setting the gains on your amplifier. That is the one thing that so many new people just don't understand how to do properly, okay? The number one way to do it, the most accurate way, in all honesty, is an oscilloscope. 
most people don't have an oscilloscope, at least a legitimate one, okay? There's a lot of ones you can find on Amazon, some cheapo ones for 20, 30 bucks, and I've, I've had some of those, I've used them, and surprisingly, they're somewhat accurate. Um, but, you know, a legitimate oscilloscope um, you're, where you can actually see the sine wave so you can set the gains properly on your speakers is going to be the best way to do that. Um, I'm not gonna get too much more into this because I have a complete video uh, designated to setting gains properly on your amplifier. Again, I'm gonna put the link down below uh, so that you can click on that so you can see how to properly do that. But it's vital, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Because what it boils down to is you want to send clean signals to your speakers, okay? Clean signals, okay, have nice sine waves moving up and down, okay? Clipped, distorted signals, okay, it's very choppy and your speakers and voice coils suffer from it because when you send a clip signal to your subs, it generates thermal heat and subwoofers, amplifiers, electronics in general do not like heat. So let's just leave it at that. Again, that video below uh, will answer all your questions on how to set your gain properly by ear, not having to spend money on expensive equipment or any kind of device to do it for you, right? Because why do something uh, your well, why not do something yourself, right? If you can do it, right? Instead of having a computer or a device do it for you, because it's totally possible. I've been doing it for over uh, 20 years and I've had great results doing it. So um, anyway, let's move on to number five. All right, number five, we're almost halfway there. So uh, number five, not fusing properly. Uh, I see a lot of people that still don't even fuse their power wires. I mean, that's just crazy. I mean, I understand if it's a dedicated competition vehicle and you're looking to squeeze every drop of amperage out of your charging system, great. But for a street beater, right, for a daily driver, it would be ludicrous to not fuse your stereo, okay, and do it properly. Um, I've seen I've seen some crazy things, right? Like people um, fusing, like they have a secondary battery in the back and they have their main battery up front, right? They're running a power wire from the front all the way to the back. Well, most people, they just fuse the front, believe it or not, right? Coming off their main battery and they forget that they have to fuse both sides of the wire, right? You fuse 18 inches from any source of power. So for example, right, let's say you had a front battery and you had one auxiliary battery and you had it linked up with one run of zero gauge wiring. So what you would do is you would put an inline fuse within 18 inches from the front battery, anywhere within 18 inches of that wire in the battery. And then the same thing on the back, right? Within 18 inches of the back battery terminal, put an inline fuse there, okay? A lot of people have the misconception too of what you're actually fusing. You're fusing to protect the wire. That way if the wire shorts out, okay, that fuse is gonna pop first before the wire burns up and catches your car on fire. So make sure that you properly fuse, okay? Far too often we see people skimp on that, um, you know, get lazy on it and they don't fuse their system. Uh, we've seen cars burn down, I mean, just, you, you can go to Google and, and find people that, you know, don't fuse their electrical systems and their car audio builds and their cars are burning down. So, you know, just be smart. You know, you don't want to be that guy. So just make sure that you do properly fuse with the right amperage, okay? And if you don't know, there's plenty of charts out there that you can reference as far as, okay, I'm running this gauge wire. What size fuse should I use, okay? Very simple. Fuse your system. Number six, wasting money. <laughs> Gosh, you know, anybody in car audio can laugh at this because uh, it's almost like a thing, right? You build it, okay, I want it louder. Then you rebuild and then, okay, I want it louder, I rebuild, okay? That's fine, okay? Because that's something that I know I've done a hundred times, any car audio enthusiast, right? It's all about rebuilding, looking forward to that next build, getting louder, getting louder. That's not what I mean, okay? What I mean is, doing it right the first time, right? With the things that you need to get the job done, okay? What I mean by that is like kind of tying into the electrical, right? Let's, the number one thing that I talked about. If you know that you're going to need a 350 amp alternator, then don't just settle for a 250 amp aftermarket alternator, okay? If you think that in the next, for, in, the, in the near foreseeable future that you're gonna need more amperage out of your alternator, then just 
wait another month if you need to to accumulate the money or whatever the case may be and just get the bigger one okay get the one that you know you're going to need not the one that's just going to get you by because you're going to regret it and you're going to have to spend more money and try to sell the other one okay i've done that too okay and it's the same thing for subwoofers it's the same thing for wiring gosh i remember when i first got started i you know got all my wiring done but it was you know it was copper clad aluminum right cca which you know isn't bad but it's budget friendly and I didn't want to just spend a little bit more on OFC, which is obviously superior to CCA. And I ended up pulling out all my OFC and replacing it with CCA, right? When I would have actually saved money and spent less if I would have just put OFC throughout to begin with. So just be smart, okay? If you know you're gonna need something, but you don't have the money for it right away, then just have a little bit of patience and wait until you can do it once and do it right. So that way you're not rebuilding. Plan it out, right? Um, you know, if you fail to plan, then plan to fail. Because if you don't have things laid out, okay, I need this, I need that, um, I'm gonna need this, this is how many of these I need, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna just start piecing it together piece by piece, and you're gonna realize, oh, I missed this, oh, I bought this when I should have bought that. Uh, and then you're gonna have to return things and buy something else and try to sell things. You know, Just be a good planner, learn how to be organized, and uh, you're gonna save yourself a lot of grief and a lot of money. All right, this is something that I've seen a lot happen uh, for a lot of new people when we go to car stereo shows and car shows in general is a lot of people, you know, they're, you know, they're looking for that loud bass, that loud sub stage, but they neglect their front stage, uh, which is going to give you some great sound quality and, you know, basically fill in the sound stage so you have good sounding tunes. It's not just loud and, uh, you know, ridiculous, but it also, you know, you get those vocals, you get those drum beats. And you know you can actually hear uh, a, a full sound stage because, in all honesty, right? This was me in the beginning. I just cared about the loud bass. I just wanted to go boom, boom, boom. Um, you know, and, and that's all I cared about. But you know, as I matured in the car audio world, you know, there's more to it than just that. You got the front stage, right? You got mid bass. You got the high end with your tweeters. Uh, you know, they all produce a symphony to give you a full and better experience when you're listening to it. So don't neglect that, right? I would start, you know, if you're from square one, I would start at least with a good set of components, right? Get a good woofer, a good tweeter, tie it into a good external crossover and make sure you give it the proper power. You will not understand how much better that sounds than just running stock speakers, right? Especially, um, you know, if, if they're old and just, you know, falling apart. Uh, at the minimum, you can replace your door speakers, okay, with some aftermarket ones, and then you know send proper power to those. Even replacing your head unit, um, if it's an old style, old fashioned head unit, replacing your head unit that has some equalization or maybe a DSP um, is going to absolutely just be a game changer as far as how your stereo sounds. Not only that, it's going to give you more expandability options uh, when it comes to running amplifiers because. I don't know any modern deck these days that don't have some form of pre-amplifier outputs, right? And the more money you spend on a head unit, the nicer it's gonna be, the higher voltage those preamp pre -amp outputs are gonna be, the more features, the more bands of equalization you're gonna have. So um, again, that's something I wouldn't skimp on. If you know you're gonna be vested into the car audio scene, I would get a good head unit, do it once, do it right, so you're not continuing, okay, I'm gonna upgrade, okay, sell that, I'm gonna upgrade, sell that, I'm gonna upgrade. That just bounces us right back into the past one of quit wasting your money, okay? So don't neglect your front stage, don't neglect your head unit, right? Do it right. All right, so next one is low or crappy bass output, <laughs> okay? Have you ever hooked up a system, okay? Maybe this is you, maybe this is not, and I've made a couple mistakes before that I wasn't paying attention on, but uh, have you ever hooked up your stereo and realized, man, it's not as loud as it should be, or it doesn't sound right, or you know, why are they moving funky, or whatever the case may be, okay? It boils down to you know just a few core things, okay? Number one, you got to make sure that you're setting your subwoofer up for success. That means putting it in the proper box that it was designed for. Was it designed for sealed? Was it designed for ported? Um, on top of that, how much airspace does your sub need? That is a huge mistake a lot of rookies make, right? They buy a big 18 inch sub, right? And they put it in a small little two cubic foot ported box and they wonder why it doesn't sound good, right? Why it doesn't perform? Um, the bigger the sub, the more space you need, okay? Typically an 18 inch sub is gonna need quite a bit of space 
And uh, most small trunks and little compact cars just can't accommodate that. So, you know, make sure that you're giving your subwoofer the space it needs, make sure you're giving it the enclosure that it needs, and make sure, more importantly, so you don't waste your money, you're giving it the power that it needs. Um, you know, things like that are really, really important. Um, other things that can affect your base output is polarity. It can get confusing, especially if you're wiring up multiple DVC subwoofers. Uh, okay, so um, black goes to red, really, and red goes to black, and you know it, it goes against common knowledge as far as okay, red with red, black to black. But when you're wiring things in series, and you know going from series to parallel or parallel to series, and you know trying to get a final load, there's going to be some confusion. That's why always plan, be organized, right? Draw it out. I always draw out my systems. I never just, in the moment, jump in there and start wiring things up. I always get a pen and paper. I put the subwoofers, I put the, you know, the, the ohm load and what I'm looking for, and I actually put, okay, this wire is gonna go to this one, this one's gonna this one. I, I get a red pen and I get a black pen, so there's no confusion. So that way, when I'm in my car or in somebody's car hooking it up, there is no confusion. It's not like, okay, well shoot, what was it? Now does this one go here and that one go there? No, I know exactly what's going where, so there's no mix up in polarity. Because what happens is if you want, if you hook up one subwoofer, right, with uh, you know the proper phase, and then you hook the other one up with a 180 degree phase, meaning on one, on one subwoofer you put positive and negative properly, but on the other subwoofer you put positive and negative switch, what's gonna happen is, okay, Instead of moving like this, this is what's gonna happen. And guess what? You're gonna get cancellation and it's, it's almost gonna have no output. You're not gonna hear anything. And you're gonna wonder, why is my bass so low? I got two 12s back here, I should be pounding. But you don't hear anything. It's because you messed up your polarity, okay? So you gotta pay attention to detail and focus on things like that. And there's a lot more, but those are the biggest things that we see as far as mistakes people make. Another huge mistake, people taking shortcuts. Shortcuts is not something you should do in the car audio world, period, okay? Because it never pays off. Don't put a $5 bill where a $10 bill should go, okay? Don't be lazy, that's number one. I'm talking to you, don't be lazy. Uh, perfect example, we see it all the time, right? We all know as installers that you should run your power wires and your signal wires, right, down opposite sides of the car. That way you don't have any interference and you don't have any humming or any um, background noise. But a lot of people still to this day, they don't think it's necessary and they run power wires from their battery to the trunk and their signal wires from the head unit to the trunk all down the same side because they're too lazy and they don't wanna take off the panels and uh, you know the door sill trim and all that to run everything down opposite sides. You know, perfect example, don't take shortcuts because it's not gonna pay off for you, okay? You're gonna get a result that is less than optimal and you're gonna end up disappointing yourself, okay? That's just one silly example. Another thing that people don't do, right, is they don't do sound deadening. Sound deadening is something that can increase your quality of sound tremendously. Um, but what do people do? They just throw a big system in, they don't deaden their vehicle and you know, they're rattling, they're vibrating. And you know, I do that too, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but uh, you know, I, when I first put the system in here, I did put some sound deadening in there before putting it in, but I wasn't anticipating how much my vehicle was gonna vibrate. So I had to actually pull it out and put more sound deadening everywhere, in the panels, um, in the hatch, and now it's quieted down quite a bit. But uh, you know, that's something I should have done again, right? Not take a shortcut and just double up on the front end so I didn't have to redo my work. But uh, just don't take shortcut, guys. You know, if you know you should do something, then you probably should do it. All right, and this brings us to our last point. And it's something that I truly believe, being a car audio enthusiast, will add the most value to you, but people don't do. And what is that? They don't ask questions. They don't seek perspective. They don't allow themselves to receive mentorship, so to speak, from people that are veterans in the car audio world, right? Could be pride, could be ego of, oh man, I know how to do it, I can figure it out, right? Um, when you have access to people, um, not only on YouTube, but I mean, go to your local car shows, go to sound off competitions, you know, talk to some of the judges, right? Talk to people that have, you know, $50,000 bills that are running 100,000 watts and just talk to them and say, hey man, how'd you get started in car audio? You know, what were some of the mistakes you made? You know, what would you recommend to somebody, you know, just getting started that, you know, is running 212s? 
you know, to, you know, scale it up to a point where I can get here one day, you know, what, what are some things that you would recommend, right? Getting perspective um, is something that I wish I would have done earlier on because I made a lot of mistakes that cost a lot of money, where if I would have just simply gotten some advice or maybe been to a couple more shows or watched a couple more videos, I could have prevented those mistakes and learned a lot more instead of having it cost so much. So uh, that's the biggest thing. And I wanted to end with that because again, I think that will add the most value to you down the road. So I hope this helped, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, again, the, there's a lot more than just 10, okay? There's a lot more things, a lot more intricacies, a lot more uh, things going on behind the scenes of these 10 steps that, you know, really culminate into the culture of car audio of doing it right. And it's something that just takes experience. It's something that it's a, it takes a growth curve. It takes sometimes trial and error. But uh, at the end of the day, it's definitely an awesome um, hobby to be in. It's an awesome community to be involved with. Um, it's very rewarding, right? P putting your own stereo in, especially if you do your own installations. Um, it is very rewarding to get everything hooked up. And that first time you power it on and you hear that thing just hit, it is absolutely worth it. So anyway, uh, I think we're done here. If anybody has any questions, make sure to just ask, comment below. Please make sure to subscribe to my channel, turn on your notifications, definitely helps out. But uh, hey, let's go out there and uh, make the world loud.